Uh, maybe that'll come out at some point in the uh, cockpit voice recorder that, uh, hey, we're really low here. We have got to get some altitude underneath of us, you know, or something. And no, no, we, we we're turning way too close to the airport. That turn's never going to work. We don't know. Maybe they had those conversations or maybe they did not. But at the point they would have seen that hill, it was it was almost too late. I mean, what would any of us have done? Probably yank back on the wheel or maybe try to turn and yank back on the wheel. And we know what happens when we try that. That's Rob Mark talking about a Learjet that crashed last week in San Diego. And while it may seem like a simple stall spin accident, there's a lot that led up to that point and many lessons we can learn, including the need for you to be able to display relative terrain when you fly at night or IFR. Today, we'll dissect the accident and ask you to think about at what point you will go around or divert in similar situations. And please listen to the end when I mention other facts about the accident and talk about resources you can use to make your flying safer. Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. Last week in episode 213, we talked with Catherine Cavagnaro about aircraft type clubs and why pilots should join one. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 213. And if you feel you're getting value from this show and learning things that could save your life, please sign up as a member to support the show financially. Just go now to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, which takes you to our Patreon site where you can sign up and read about the goodies you'll get. We're listener supported and still ad free, and we greatly appreciate your support. Now let me tell you a little about Rob Mark. He's worked as both an air traffic controller and as an airline, corporate pilot, and CFI. Rob publishes the JetWine blog at jetwine.com, and you can find his writing in the pages of Business and Commercial Magazine, which is part of the Aviation Week group. And now here's our conversation with Rob Mark. Well, Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us under these very sad circumstances. Thank you for inviting me, Max. And of course, the one thing we want to make sure that we talk about here is that uh, we, we say some of the uh, uh, things that come to mind as we watch the facts pass before us, but but it's not an indictment of the pilots. I mean, look, everybody makes mistakes. Our hearts go out to the families uh, of these uh, two pilots and, of course, the two uh, uh, hospital ground workers that were on board as well. And uh, but we're hoping that perhaps someone can take a lesson or two away and uh, and prevent this from happening to them. Yes, absolutely. This, this was a tragedy. But the reason we talk about these things is so that hopefully we can learn something from the accident so that we you know, don't repeat it ourselves. And I think there's really an opportunity here to kind of help people understand how this unfolded. This to me was a fairly complicated accident. What's interesting to me is that when they started, looked like a pretty reasonable plan, but then things deteriorated. And pilots just always need to have options. And we need to force ourselves to constantly evaluate the options at every stage of the game. Uh, it's kind of ironic, but I was taking a shower earlier today and I heard the the gambler playing and they talk about you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away. And I think this is probably a, an accident where there were different points where people might have chosen to to walk away from this and divert and, and do something else. So as we're talking about this, I really hope people will uh, kind of think about at what point would I as a pilot commit to doing something different if I ever find myself in this situation? I think that's a very good point. And of course, what we'll see as we talk about this is that it seemed like a very simple night flight to reposition this Learjet back to its home field at Gillespie, uh, which is 12 miles east, northeast of San Diego. And uh, so what they planned on was, a, let's just jump in the jet, take it back home. And as they took off, the weather started to change. And of course, your decision tree changes uh, as the weather changes. And uh, well, we're wondering about some of the decisions that it seemed like this crew made. Yeah, I think this initially to me sounded like a classic stall spin accident where pilots are overshooting the base to final and you know, take heroic measures to try and uh, fix that turn. But this actually, I think, is quite a bit more complicated than this. The Learjet 35A was doing a night landing at Gillespie Field. They had to do a, a circling approach at night 
even though they canceled IFR, though technically it wasn't a circling approach, it was following the same path that you might fly for a circling approach. And suddenly they found themselves a few hundred feet below a mountain that was right in front of them. And they crashed a 10th of a mile from the base of that mountain. Now I flew the profile in the simulator last night and it was scary, even with the simulator set for the daytime. At one point I found myself in a 60 degree bank trying to avoid the mountain. I can only imagine that in night and bad weather, it would be really easy to lose control if you got surprised by that uh, mountain in front of you. There was a porch camera which caught the plane flying overhead a few seconds before the crash. And in that uh, audio, you can actually hear the engine spooling up uh, shortly thereafter. The ATC audio has the pilot uh, saying several expletives. And I really think that what happened was that these pilots got surprised uh, by that mountain, added power, tried to maneuver to avoid the mountain, got slow and stalled. But the interesting thing to me is not that they got slow and stalled, but rather what were the different signposts along the way, which were kind of warning signs that said, hey, this approach may not be working out and you know it could be leading to an accident. One thing I noticed uh, right off is that the approaches into Gillespie are limited. Uh, they have a, a an east-west runway and a north-south runway. Uh, but again, very, very limited approaches, one from the north, landing on uh, runway 17, which is about 4,200 feet or somewhere in that general vicinity. The east-west runway is longer, almost 1,000 feet longer. But again, not a great many IFR options. And one of the things that limits them is that if anybody takes a look at Gillespie Field on a chart, uh, there are some pretty uh, incredible hills to the east and northeast of the airport which really limits what you can do. And of course, if that wasn't enough, it was night and the weather was not terrific. It was legally VFR, uh, three miles in fog uh, with a broken deck at 2,000 feet. But again, at night, uh, in, a, in a kind of a misty uh, situation, uh, the visibility is never straight ahead as, as we expect it. Remember, as the visibility comes down, your eyes go further and further down closer to the nose of the airplane. But these guys were doing 140 knots. So what's that? Two Over two miles a minute. So it didn't take long for them to get anywhere. But we're going to find out a little more as we go on. Yeah, this all evolved very, very quickly. Uh, from the time they uh, turned onto the downwind, they had about 40 seconds left before they crashed. Uh, and so... Boy, at night, close to the ground, uh, it would have been a very scary situation uh, given the weather they had. Well, part of the challenge is this was a, a Part 135 flight, an air ambulance. This is certainly a very noble uh, you know, profession that these people were performing. According to a GoFundMe I read about online, they had been flying uh, everything from organs to uh, patients all over the country for different kinds of life-saving procedures. Now, Rob, I know you've, you've flown Part 135 before. Talk a little bit about the demands of flying for a Part 135 operation. Well, of course, I think that the uh, air ambulance uh, world is is unbelievable to me, uh, ha even though I flew passengers on demand. Sometimes those demands uh, included getting up in the middle of the night. Uh, but again, we were, we were starting relatively fresh. Uh, but again, I think air ambulance is just such a holy smokes, guys, we got to go and we got to go right now because this patient's life depends upon it. Uh, whether they're transporting an organ or picking somebody up for an organ transplant and things happen very, very quickly. But again, 135 is a commercial operation. It's not the airlines. That's, of course, 121. But 135 has different rules in terms of pilot qualifications, in terms of uh, what the FAA says the pilots are allowed to do. And then, of course, there are the op specs for the company involved that may also limit the operation as to what kinds of runways they can land on, how much extra leeway they need to figure out uh, in their uh, landing and takeoff calculations. Usually, it, it adds distance. Uh, for takeoff and or landing. And just in general, it's not quite as easy as VFR pilots might think. You don't just fire up the airplane, hop in and go. 
Yeah, and part of it is you're not just doing the flying, you're doing everything else. And that could be greeting the passengers and loading the baggage. And I mean, it's a heck of a lot of work. It's not just flying the airplane. Oh, no. And, and of course, uh, even in a corporate situation, the other pilot, uh, usually the junior person, is is checking the weather. They're uh, checking the fuel supply. Uh, they're making sure they can pick up fuel at the other end. They're arranging to make sure the ground transportation is where it should be at the destination. There's lots of bits and pieces. And again, but you're you're more limited in a 135 operation than you are in a 91, which is what most of us are used to flying. Yeah. And one of the things I've read online is that this company may have had an op spec that limited the length of their runway. And it probably had to have a runway of at least 5,000 feet, which meant they couldn't land straight in for runway 17. Well, let's talk about the day a little bit. What were the flights that they did and how long were they on duty and so on? Sure. Well, the uh, flights were actually rather short. But the uh, crew, we think the crew probably came on duty at least an hour or so before they departed um, earlier that afternoon, maybe 12, 1 o'clock local. We're not absolutely certain of that. Uh, but uh, they flew from uh, Gillespie Field up to Lake Havasu. Did I get that right? Uh, up on the uh, state line there between uh, Arizona and California? Yeah, that's right. It's Pretty short flight, non-commercial airport, no airline flights in there, but a quiet, nice uh, airport. I've been there a few times. Sure. And, and, and we believe they picked up a patient there in Lake Havasu and then flew up to uh, to John Wayne Airport, dropped off the passenger, and then they uh, hopped back in the airplane for that flight back to Gillespie. And of course, it was taking place eh, roughly 6.30, at the last leg, 6.30 at night or so. And, and again, it to John Wayne, the weather would have told them that the uh, weather at Gillespie was pretty good. Uh, so they, you know, they may have expected ten mile visibility and some clouds around twenty nine hundred feet or so, but nothing, nothing to be terribly concerned about. But then it changed. Yeah. So certainly, if you kind of look at the flight, they were on the ground for two hours at John Wayne. Plenty of time to look at the weather. The weather had been ten mile visibility for multiple hours. Looked great. Nine minutes before they took off, the weather came out as being much lower, suddenly dropped from 10 miles to three miles with mist, clouds lowered to a 2,000 broken, overcast to 2,600. I think it's unlikely that they probably had that weather before they left just because if they were looking at it over the internet, it takes some time for that to get updated. Maybe they happened to call on their cell phone to get the weather, but I'm guessing they didn't find out about this weather until they were in flight. And at three mile visibility, 2000 broken, I think a lot of instrument pilots would say, okay, this still looks like a go for me. Sure. If you are not circling, we're already set up for easy peasy flight, even though it's evening and that's what we think we're going to see. And they took off. And as you said, the weather changed and uh, that's not quite what they found when they got to the other end. Yes, for me, if I could do a straight in approach to a landing, to me, this would have been a go. I've always said that I won't circle at night, especially not in weather. And the reason is that there are just a lot of night circling accidents. I talked about this in episode 199, and I found a study that said that the accident rate for circling approaches is 25 times higher than that for straight in approaches with a glide slope. And to me, that's huge. If you think about it, often when we look at factors, it's like, oh, this increases by 20% or 30% or, oh, it's going to be double the risk. 25 times the risk. That is just a huge, huge number. And that's really what's convinced me that I really don't want to be circling if I can have another option. And there's always another option, even if that option is land with a tailwind or fly to another airport. I think we should also mention that in this flight that we're going to talk about, this could have been a uh, a small airplane on a VFR flight uh, just as well. And, uh, and when things change, your thought pattern, your risk management skills have to kick in and say, okay, all right, so we thought this was going to be easy peasy, but the only thing I see right now is the weather's gone down. But as the cockpit crew, I would be saying, uh, how much further is it going to go down? Uh, what's the rate at which the weather is changing, even though we're not there? Okay, let's, we'll just leave that for now. We'll take a look when we get there. But we know we'd like to land on 2-7. 
And is there anything that's going to preclude us from doing that? Well, we don't know yet. So let's just take off. We'll go and we get close to Gillespie and we find out that the, uh, again, the weather's uh, three miles in fog and uh, uh, some uh, clouds at about 2,000 feet. And okay, that's that's also a little different than what we expected. Um, so how are we going to get in there? Because it has limited options uh, as far as instrument approaches go. The two approaches or the three approaches we have are uh, very limited in terms of circling at night. Hmm. Okay. And keep in mind, it's not that the FAA just decided to say, oh, circling at Gillespie's just, it's just not cool at night. There is a reason for that. And the reason, of course, is that there is terrain to the east of the airport that you can't see in the dark. And if everybody thinks that three miles of visibility at night is no big deal, I would challenge them to go out and fly with somebody when it's three miles at night and see how far ahead of the airplane you can see. It's not far at all. And uh, and again, realize how fast these guys are going. Yeah. And you throw in some light rain and that really makes it more difficult as well. Well, let's talk about the approach that they were on. It was the GPS 17, pretty much a straight into runway 17, though it comes in at a, a slight angle. It has LP minimums for WAS capable aircraft, which means you could go down to 1,360 feet, which is about a thousand feet above the field elevation. If you have an older non WAS GPS, the minimums are 20 feet higher, but no circling allowed to any of the other runways except for runway nine left. So if they landed straight into runway one seven, yep, would have been easy. That runway is a thousand feet shorter. And frankly, they had to cancel IFR in order to legally land on the two seven right. So let's go ahead and play some of the audio here. This is the beginning of the conversation with the tower. This occurred when they were about 13 miles out as they were descending through about 4,500 feet. Gillespie Tower, clear 880 Zulu is with you on the GPS 17. What is that? Clear 880 Zulu, Gillespie Tower, wind 190 at 5, runway 17, clear to land. Runway And then about four minutes later, when they were roughly three miles out from the field and passing through somewhere around 1,400 feet, somewhere around the, the minimums for the approach, they had this conversation. Yeah, zero four inside. We'd like to squat VFR for uh, 880 Zulu. Major 80 Zulu, Roger, runway 17, clear to land. Now we'd like to take uh, runway uh, 27, 80 Zulu. Major 80 Zulu, understand you're, then you're canceling IFR? Yes, sir. Major 80 Zulu, IFR cancellation received. You can overfly the field, make left traffic, runway 27 right, to runway 27 right, clear to land. Change to runway 27 right, clear to land. Clear to 27 right, clear to land, 80 Zulu. And can you top the lights for us a little bit more? They're at 100% now. Now let's talk about the other options they had. There weren't very many of them. They could have circled to runway nine left. There are also hills west of the field that rise to about 1,200 feet. And often the clouds are worse toward the ocean. So we just don't know what the visibility and clouds look like in that direction. Now they might have thought about flying the GPS nine left approach, but there are some big problems with that approach. Talk about that. Well, the uh, the GPS to nine is uh, interesting because you think, well, it's easy peasy again. We'll just land going the other way because the winds weren't that strong. However, the uh, nine uh, left GPS approach is only available to category A and B. And of course, the Learjet 35, which was the airplane in question here, is depending on the speed, it's certainly a category C, but I don't think it's a uh, quite category D, somewhere in between. But again, that's all based on speed. And so that really wasn't an option for them either. And again, no circling off of that approach. So that that kind of limits us uh, on, on that one. Uh, and again, we know that they can't circle legally off the 1-7 approach. But however, why didn't they just come in from the east? There's that localizer approach to 2-7 uh, to right from the east, Max. Yeah, and it certainly looks like it might be a good option. They could have had a straight into runway 27, right, theoretically, if they use this approach, but not really. The localizer uh, brings you into 27, right, but there are a whole bunch of problems with it. First of all, for a category C or D aircraft like they were, 
the MDA is 1,940 feet. So that's just, what, 60 feet below the broken layer that they're reporting at 2,000 feet. So I think the odds of being able to get in would have been really iffy. I wouldn't want to have taken that approach. It comes in over the hills. The weather's often worse by the hills. But then the really big problem is that when you get to the final step down and you start heading on down to the runway, it's a extremely steep gradient. Most approaches have a three degree glide slope. If you're at hundred knots, you're coming down maybe 500 feet per minute. This has almost a seven degree gradient, 6.88 degrees. So that's more than double the standard gradient. And my quick back of the envelope calculation was that at an approach speed of around 140, a Learjet would be coming down maybe around 1,700 feet per minute on that last <laughs> segment. Now, that would really, I think in most people's book, be considered an unstable approach. And so that's why this is uh, labeled as a circling approach. If you look at the title of the approach, it doesn't say localizer 27 right. It says localizer D. The reason it's a circling approach is even though it's straight into the runway, the descent rate is so absurd that you would be unstable. So they don't allow it to be labeled as a straight in approach. Not only that, on this particular approach, they don't permit circling at night to the straight in runway 27 right. So even though it's straight into the runway at night, you can't land on the 27 right. So if you look at all of these uh, different approaches, they didn't have a lot of good options and they probably did pick the best option that was available to them. Well, that's right. And of course, we, we know that they were planning on an easy peasy approach and then they got close to the airport and the weather was down and they start going, hmm, okay, no big deal. We'll just we'll just cancel and uh, north of the airport and circle uh, into 27 right. And again, with the visibility at three in fog in the dark, eh, that's not quite so easy. And as you said, they really did not have a great many options if they were going to indeed continue to land. And and why would they want to land? Because the airplane was based there. Exactly. Yeah, personally, I would be out of there. I'd be diverting to Montgomery, which is eight miles away. They had seven-mile visibility, 2,200-foot overcast, and an ILS. Though that runway is only 4,500 feet long. So if their off-spec called for 5,000 feet, well, then they'd be off to uh, San Diego Lindbergh Field 12 miles away. But again, part 135, talk about some of the reasons the crew might have been reluctant to divert. Well, 135, especially an air ambulance uh, operation, they're an on-call operation, which means they want the airplane at home base so that if they are called out on a moment's notice, they can stock the airplane and be ready to go pick up that passenger or that vital organ. And if, if this thing is sitting over at uh, Montgomery or at Lindbergh Field, which not really very far away, really, Lindbergh, what, 12 miles? I mean, at the speed they were going, eh, five minutes tops. And of course, if it's someplace else, that means they probably have to figure out how to get it back to Gillespie initially, uh, stock the airplane and be ready to go for the next flight. And of course, then there's the issue of uh, pilots driving around uh, trying to get home from from Lindbergh or Montgomery, and that just delays them. And so they really didn't want to have to do that. Uh, no, we don't know what the uh, management of this company was like. Absolutely no idea. When I flew 135, they were, they were pretty darn good. If we said we're not doing something, they just went along with it. We didn't get any pressure. But but all 135s are not like that. So we don't know what kinds of additional pressures there may have been from the company or perhaps uh, in the lives of either of these pilots. Yeah, certainly get-home-itis is real. I have experienced that myself, even though I thought I wouldn't. Uh, nothing like a crying two-year-old to cloud your judgment and kind of feel like, oh, I really got to get home. But let's come back to the flight track. So they've arrived at the airport and they're going to be flying to runway 27 right. So they're going to have to uh, fly a traffic pattern. If I were doing that, I would want to be at least at the traffic pattern altitude, which is 1,000 feet above the field, 1,388 feet. Or maybe I'd like to be at the circling minimums of 1,440 feet. It's going to give me a little bit more protection. Or I might even be at 1,500 feet AGL because that's the standard jet traffic pattern. But here's the thing that I had trouble trying to understand why they did this. 
As they flew the GPS approach, they continued descending all the way down to 725 feet as they crossed the field, which would be roughly 350 feet above the ground. I don't understand why they did that. Can you think of any good reason for being that low at that point? No. And uh, of course, when they canceled the IFR with the controller in the tower, uh, he just said, hey, uh, uh, fly over the top of the airport, enter a left downwind for runway 27 right. And uh, that makes perfect sense. But to cross the airport at 300 feet in the air at 140 knots, I mean, everything on the ground would have been a blur anyway. Yeah, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I think if I look at this entire accident, to me, that's where I kind of point to the low altitude and say, all right, this really looks like the first mistake in the chain of errors that we've got. When I teach people to fly at night, I tell them, you want to do everything as close to normal as possible. For example, if a tower gives me a base entry at night, I tell them, no, we'd rather like to come in on the 45 and fly the full traffic pattern because I want to be doing it exactly the same way at night that I'm doing it in the daytime. Because when you do that, you're going to spot the errors more quickly if you're doing everything the same way every time. So at this particular point in time, if I were the the co-pilot, and we're 350 feet above the runway planning to enter the traffic pattern, I think I would be yelling, go around because yeah, you might be able to fix it, but everything is going to be different the whole way around. You know, now, instead of descending in the traffic pattern, you're climbing in the traffic pattern. Everything is just kind of backwards. I think too that, uh, I don't know if you did this, but I always did with students when I check them out at night, we, we'd fly traffic patterns. And I'd let them, I'd say, let's go down and, you know, on the side of the airport where we're not going to bother anybody, let's go down to 400 feet or 500 feet off the ground and see it. Does the picture look exactly the same of the airport to you at this altitude that it did when we were at a thousand feet? And they go, oh no, not at all. So now they've added another element when they're that low is that the airport uh, environment looks very, very different. And of course, the one thing that made it, again, another problem, they turned a very, very close downwind to the runway, which in an airplane that is that fast, you're eating up ground really quickly. And when you do make that turn from downwind to base to final, if you're really close to the airport, you're never going to make it. You don't have enough time because uh, a jet at that speed takes much longer to complete a turn than uh, a pilot, say, in a 150 at 60 knots. So you just can't get away with that. So now we've added a few more elements uh, that that made this problem even worse. Yeah, this is a really important point. I see this with a lot of accidents we look at where someone is low on downwind. When you're low on downwind, in order to make the view look correct, you have to be closer to the runway than you normally would be. And once you're in tight, close to the runway, now you've set up a very short base, which increases the odds of overshooting the base to final turn. When I'm in the Cirrus, I'm typically at least 0.7 to maybe 1.0 nautical miles away from the, the runway when I'm on downwind. These guys, instead of flying 100 knots like the Cirrus, they're doing about 140 so the turn radius is proportional to the square of the speed. So that means they really need to be at least, you know, 1.5 to 2 miles away from the, the runway. And they were about 0.8. So at that point in time, you could predict these people were not going to be able to join the final. It was guaranteed that they were going to overshoot unless they did absurdly steep banks, which you certainly don't want to be doing when you're in the traffic pattern. So once again, this would kind of be the second point where I would be saying, oops, hey, let's go around. I'm out of here. We are too close to the runway on our downwind. We're set up for failure. This is not going to work. That's true. Now, of course, we don't know uh, the exact experience of the two pilots. We don't know how they got along with each other. Uh, some pilots would uh, look at that and say, this isn't going to work, Max. Come on, what are we doing? We're either going to put some power in here and climb up and maybe go around and try it again visually, but it doesn't look good or we're, we've got to go someplace else. And that's the, the pushy pilot in me when I start getting really nervous. And, and in this case, I would have been absolutely nervous. And uh, 
Now, of course, one thing that we also are used to these days is that glass airplanes usually have a a great navigational display in them, uh, uh, maybe a ground track uh, so that you can keep track of where you are and and the pilot flying can look at the screen and go, yeah, you're right. This isn't going to work. Uh, but now we don't know. This is an older Learjet, uh, a 35A, so built in what, maybe the 80s or something? Yes. But we don't know that they had any of these fancy devices that we're used to now. Were they using ForeFlight on an iPad? Maybe, but we don't know that either. And uh, so, again, now you have them turning a close downwind low at night in three miles and uh, going really going pretty darn quick. And they really didn't seem to know where they were in terms of their ground track versus where they should be to stay away from, let's see, what's that thing out there to the east of the uh, uh, airport on almost on final, Max? Yeah, Rattlesnake Mountain. If you think about the ground track, someone at one of the, the beach forums online put together a plot that showed previous tracks from this uh, aircraft when they were flying this particular uh, circling maneuver to a two seven right and in both the prior cases that they found, the aircraft was either uh, 0.3 or 0.6 miles further to the west. In other words, when they crossed over the airport, runway 17 was to the left of the aircraft, so the pilot could see 17 below them. This particular ground track, they crossed to the uh, east of uh, 17, uh, and so the aircraft was considerably further east as it crossed the field which now offsets the entire uh, traffic pattern further to the east, closer to Rattlesnake Mountain. And so if you also look at those tracks, when they turned to base, they didn't just make a square 90-degree base. They turned so that they were angled in toward the runway. Now, I do that often if I'm flying to parallel runways because I don't want to overshoot the uh, the other runway. I think these pilots probably did it on prior flights because they wanted to make sure that they're not pointed at Rattlesnake Mountain. Well, in this particular case, when they turned base, they turned a pretty square 90-degree base. They were a little bit further to the east because of where they had started their approach, and now they were pointed right straight at Rattlesnake Mountain. The flight aware data shows that they were about 950 feet. Rattlesnake goes up to about 1,200 feet, and the uh, crash site was right at the base of the hill, about 0.1 nautical miles from the, uh, the hill if they had continued straight and level. They were about 0.3 miles from, uh, you know, the impact point on the mountain. And so suddenly I would imagine that if people were looking out the left window, looking for the runway and suddenly saw this mountain looming in front of them, you know, 250 feet above them, that would be sheer terror. I'm suspecting that's when we heard the pilot call out uh, several expletives. Uh, that's when the power started to increase. Uh, what would you imagine that they were going through at this particular moment? Well, when they could finally see the uh, the hill up ahead, which maybe they could because the uh, the uh, landing lights would probably have been on, uh, they'd have looked ahead and and said, "Holy, uh, there's only a, a couple of quick options. Uh, first, pour the coals to it, uh, try and climb, but also you're still even as you're climbing, you you say, I, I, I'm not going to clear that hill." So, of course, you're going to try and turn, and they're probably going to have turned towards the airport. But at that point, everything is happening so quickly. Um, did they make a nice coordinated left turn back to the airport? Mm, probably not. And and I don't want to mis, uh, mislabel this because I, I think people need to understand that the uh, the two pilots were probably both looking out the left window trying to find the runway. And when the pilot monitoring, whichever one wasn't flying, is supposed to be looking at the altimeter because they're supposed to be making sure the aircraft doesn't get too low because they know that the PIC at that point is trying to find the runway and adjust the flight path to get down in one piece. And uh, somebody should have said much earlier, at least we haven't heard it yet, uh, maybe that'll come out at some point in the uh, cockpit voice recorder 
that, uh, hey, we're really low here. We have got to get some altitude underneath of us, you know, or something. And no, no, we, we we're turning way too close to the airport. That turn's never going to work. We don't know. Maybe they had those conversations or maybe they did not. But at the point they would have seen that hill, it was it was almost too late. I mean, what would any of us have done? Probably yank back on the wheel or maybe try to turn and yank back on the wheel. And we know what happens when we try that. Once you exceed the critical angle of attack, the airplane says, OK, I'm all done flying, guys. Yeah, I suspect that they over controlled at that point. Somewhere I read that a Learjet in a landing configuration is limited to 20 degrees of bank. That's not a whole lot, especially if you suddenly find yourself with a mountain in front of you. I think that there was just an issue about position awareness for this crew. I think they felt that they were closer to the airport. I don't think they realized how far east they were. All their prior turns had been inside Rattlesnake Mountain. Here they found themselves pointed right at Rattlesnake Mountain. Yes, so the aircraft was built in 1985. Maybe it didn't have a moving map. But even something as simple as ForeFlight is going to have a relative terrain display where it colors the map to show you where the rocks are that are higher than you. And so you you, know, you avoid the red. This tells me that they probably weren't looking at some type of relative terrain display that showed them where the rocks were relative to their altitude. And that's something that I recommend that people always do at night. Make sure you've got a terrain display available that shows how high the rocks are around you. If your airplane doesn't have that, then use one of the electronic flight bag apps that do have that. One thing we also do not know about this airplane, people may be saying, well, didn't they get that that whoop, whoop, pull up uh, command uh, that we always hear about uh, in these kinds of situations? We don't know that the airplane had the terrain awareness uh, system on board. Uh, they may have, they may not have, uh, but those are predictive. If they did have it, uh, we'll probably hear something on the cockpit voice recorder that says, terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up. And trust me, when that goes off, you're, you're on the edge of already being too late. And if they didn't have that and they're relying just on their eyeballs, uh, it's pretty hard. Yeah, a lot of stuff we can get away with in the daytime. We just can't get away with it at night, and we need these extra tools to, to help us. Someone had commented online that they thought the simulator training for jet pilots for doing circling to, to land just doesn't really emulate what pilots are facing in, in these kinds of situations. And yeah, this was technically not a circle to land, but the path was the same. They were landing at night, you know, flying a circular path. Talk about the typical simulator training for a circle to land for jet pilots. I think this is a really interesting one because uh, I have not been to uh, recurrent training in a jet for quite a number of years. And I was thinking back to when I got typed in the Citation uh, 3, which was Cessna's first uh, swept wing airplane. And didn't we shoot the ILS 27 circle to land runway 18 right at night? Uh, I'd I never understood uh, why that was so popular until you mentioned that that might be one of the approaches uh, that the FAA has certified for check rides. But anyway, uh, the, the the person that's not flying has some very specific duties that they are supposed to perform. Yes, of course, glance up at the uh, out the window to see if you can keep track of where the runway is. But also the person in the right seat is responsible for calling out the altitude because you're not supposed to be leaving the uh, MDA until you're in a, a, a position to execute a safe landing. But of course, in this accident, I don't know if they were ever in that spot because they were so darned low. Yeah, and so as I thought about it, uh, we were doing the Circle to Memphis Localizer 27 approach, really where we're just in limited visibility, you know, maybe three miles, something like that. There's no terrain. You could pick out things on the ground, see buildings and runways and things like that. But that in no way resembles flying over a city near mountains. And you know, my observation over the years has been when the visibility gets poor, especially at night, and you can't see very far, 
everything on the ground really pretty much looks the same, at least in metro areas, uh, large cities out here where we are in California. It's like one city after another. You look down and it's all houses and roads and you know buildings. And you just can't tell where you are. Uh, and so I think that the practice that they got for, for circling, if they did it in a simulator, just in no way resembled what they were, were doing here. So anyway, I I think that's just an interesting point. I think it's easy for people to get in over their heads uh, with circling. I do believe it's the single hardest thing that we do as instrument pilots. One thing I was thinking about is I have never heard anybody talking about briefing the circle portion of an instrument approach. For example, people often brief the approach. Yeah, we're going to fly the runway 17. These are the altitudes and so on. And then they might say, and then we'll circle to runway 27 right. They're not saying things like, and we're going to cross the field at this altitude. We're going to be on the downwind at the uh, traffic pattern altitude or at the circling altitude. We're going to then turn to this heading. Uh, We're going to head at 090. That will put us on the downwind At the numbers, we're going to reduce the power. We're going to go ahead and start to descent. All of these kinds of things, they never get briefed. I think in this particular case, this crew probably would have flown some some different headings. Uh, And I think pilots probably are just used to kind of winging it, just like they would wing any traffic pattern. And whenever you're circling to another runway, you should just back up the landing by loading an approach to the runway you're landing on. In this case, they could have had the localizer D to runway 27 right dialed in. And if they had, they would have noticed earlier that they were in danger of overshooting the final. So I would suggest that briefing every step of the circle would be a very important enhancement to safety for people who do choose to to circle, especially at night. And I think, too, that we can't discount the fact that, again, this was their home base. They were probably rather familiar with landing at Gillespie and the challenges that there were. Realized, too, when they took off from John Wayne, they thought, easy peasy approach, and very quickly began to have one additional risk after another piled on top of this. And the easy peasy approach was becoming more and more complex were these guys ahead of the airplane or were they simply following this airplane trying to get down in one piece? We don't know. I think what the uh, cockpit voice recorder is going to tell us about the conversations they had before they even shot the one seven approach are probably going to tell us a lot. We might hear one of the pilots saying, uh, we, we've done this a hundred times. It's the same thing all the time. We just have to be a little bit careful because it's night and we kind of lose some visual references. And But but we've done this. It's no big deal until, of course, it is a big deal. And I think that most flights end up as a long straight in approach. I looked at this particular aircraft and it had not done any circles to runway uh, 27 right in the prior three months. The ones that somebody else found were prior to that. So that tells you, yeah, a circle approach uh, that might be, I don't know, one out of 20 landings. Certainly pilots don't get a lot of experience. They may underestimate how difficult they are and they just don't have the the practice doing them, which is why I think people really ought to give them more attention and think about them more. And I would tend to think of them kind of as a math problem. I think that flying a traffic pattern is essentially a math problem. You know, you want to be at certain altitudes and certain distances and certain headings and lose certain amounts of altitude at every step of the way. If people would think about the circle kind of more in those terms, I think they'd be more successful doing it. Well, and of course, I think it's important that the pilot who is going to be flying the approach completely understand why approach and the pattern is going to be the way that it is. Not simply, okay, this is how to do it. You make this turn, you make that turn, you're at this speed. But why are you doing that that way? And what are the risks involved if something changes along the way? What if they'd lost an engine as they started to cross the airport? That certainly would have kept them busy. And they had other elements of this approach that were beyond what they were probably planning for. And again, I have found that, you you know, you're still thinking like you were when you were at John Wayne, and this is all changing very, very quickly. Are you keeping up, as I said earlier, or are you just following the airplane along? Yeah, when I was in the simulator last night flying this, I was shocked at how fast it all went. I did fly the, uh, the pattern portion at 140 knots and 
from the beginning of downwind to crash was just 40 seconds. Not a lot of time to, to do all the things. I think too, that pilots also ought to think about who is going to be the pilot flying when you're flying a circle. I know that pilots often alternate legs, but suppose you're in a left circling turn as this pilot was, would you really want the FO to be the pilot flying? He's not going to be able to see the airport nearly as well as the pilot in the left seat. Oh, absolutely. This would not be an approach for the pilot in the right seat. At night, uh, when you have to look across the other pilot, and of course, as close as they were to the center of the airport before they even began the turn, as soon as they turned down, when the airport was completely out of sight to the pilot in the right seat. So again, but we don't know who was in charge of the flight. We don't know the experience of either one. We don't know their currency. We simply, again, do not know what they did brief on before they got to the airport. Uh, again, oh, piece of cake. We've done this all the time. Or, eh, we better start thinking about this one because uh, this could get a little dicey. And, hey, and, and what I would do is I'd always say, and by the way, if if at some point you don't like this or I don't like this, we're going around and we're going to name the airport. And so that's an option. It's never taken off the table when you're in this kind of situation. Forget what we talked about with pizza and all the other junk before. This has changed. It's different. And you've got to be able to keep up. Yeah, and you really have to make all these decisions before you ever leave the ground. I think this is a perfect time for people who are listening to kind of sit back in their easy chair and just kind of come up with their own personal minimums. Think about at what point in time will I promise myself that I will go around if I find myself in this particular situation? Because if you don't do it now, the decisions that you make in the air are kind of CYA. They're on the spur of the moment. They're not nearly as well thought out. The mind narrows. You may be you know, panicked a little bit. You're just not going to make as good a decision as you're going to make as you're sitting in your easy chair, kind of thinking about all the options. So I think people really need to think about plan B and plan C before they even take off. And frankly, you can make a lot of these decisions two or three years before you find yourself in these kinds of situations. I think what was interesting too, for me at least, is that I imagined being the simulator instructor in this situation. And as the crew turned the airplane north towards Rattlesnake Mountain, and where are they looking? They're looking out the left window trying to find the runway. Uh, I would freeze it right there and say, okay, so you're looking for the runway. You can't see it very well. And, and we know they've already got the lights up all the way. Where's the mountain? Where are you from the mountain right now? And if it had been this crew, they may have said, oh boy, uh, I think I lost track of it or something. Uh, because otherwise there would be no reason they would continue towards that hill other than to say, I, I, I just lost track of where it was. And then you say, okay, so you know that that's what is happening. What's the best option right here, right now? What would you do? What should you do? Uh, pour the coals to it and go around and we'll not even try it again. Uh, pour the coals, go around, and we're going to uh, we're going to Lindbergh. And I'm sorry, we'll have to deal with the transportation issue once we're on the ground, but at least we're going to be in one piece. Yeah, the simulator is such a valuable tool for some of these things. I have killed pilots in the simulator as well, and it's always a good a learning experience for them. In one particular case, I was doing some work for a local aerial mapping company, and they had a, a number of uh, younger folks, and I killed one pilot in the simulator who flew into a, a mountain. And he said, oh, but we were always trained to trust the controllers. <laughs> I said, yes, well, trust but verify, right? <laughs> it, it, they will certainly take care of you the overwhelming majority of the time. Now, I'm not saying that this particular accident was a controller error, but it's a mindset. You know, pilots need to be responsible for their position at all times. They need to be responsible for the train at all times. And you can't rely on other people or good luck to take care of that for you. No, that that's true. And, and people always used to say no controller ever killed himself falling out of his chair. And so realize that as helpful as they may be or may not be, they don't see what you do. And they're not trying to make the decisions that you are. They're probably trying to 
to expedite traffic. But when they sense that someone's in trouble, they're asking questions. Hey, uh, did you see this or are you aware of that or what? So we don't know what the conversation was, if there was any uh, between the uh, controller and the uh, and the pilot. It sounds like they didn't have any. Controllers on the ground, sees the airplane, clear to land 27 right. And hey, it's the pilot's work to get that thing in there. Yep. A lot of lessons to be learned from this particular accident. And I guess the most important thing is to remember what PIC stands for. Pilot in command, you are responsible for all aspects of the flight. And that certainly includes understanding where the terrain is located. Very true. And of course, as we found out uh, from uh, my uh, buddy, uh, Gordon Gilbert over at AIN, uh, who tracks all the accident statistics for that magazine. This crash was the first fatal accident since 2015 that involved a a U.S. registered business jet on a uh, Part 135 charter flight. Well, it's a noble profession. I know they face uh, very strong demands. I'm happy they do what they do. Rob, thanks so much for joining us here today. Hey, thanks very much for inviting me along, Max. Uh, This was was a very involved accident, and I, I hope that People have learned some of the uh, the threats, the risks that are involved in circling, especially at night. My thanks to Rob for joining us today. You can read more of his work in Business and Commercial Magazine, which is part of the Aviation Week group, and at his JetWine blog at JetWine.com. We talked about how the weather was right at VFR minimums of three miles. What we didn't mention is that three miles is also the category C and D visibility minimum for circling on the approach they flew. So the screw was flying at the absolute minimums for both VFR and IFR. In general, you don't want to fly at the absolute minimums the FAA allows. While it's legal to do so, it's not always safe. So I strongly encourage you to only fly when the weather is better than legal minimums. One key takeaway from this accident is that if you fly at night or under IFR, you need to be able to display terrain in the cockpit. If you fly a modern glass cockpit or have a modern GPS in the cockpit, Learn how to display relative terrain on your avionics. If you don't have either of these items, then make sure you have an EFB app such as ForeFlight and that you have it set so you can easily determine if you are below the surrounding hills. To do that in ForeFlight, turn on the Hazard Advisor, which you can get to by touching the Map Layers symbol. With it turned on, terrain and obstacles above you or as little as 100 feet below you are colored red and terrain between 100 and 1,000 feet below you is colored yellow. As you change altitude, the colors change. So for example, as you descend, you'll see more and more yellow and eventually red surrounding you. At night, I always fly a route that keeps me above the red and the yellow. As you know, this accident technically was not an instrument circling approach, but except for canceling IFR, it was identical to one. So I would encourage you to learn everything you can about circling to land and also about flying at night. If you haven't already heard episode 199 of Aviation News Talk, which is titled IFR Circling Approach Hazards and Tips for Flying Them, I strongly encourage you to listen to it. You can find it on YouTube or at aviationnewstalk.com slash 199 or wherever you get your podcast. Also, I mentioned in this show that the IKO study showed that circling after an instrument approach is 25 times more likely to result in an accident than flying a straight in approach with a glide slope, such as an ILS or RNAV approach with a glide path. I've included a link to that study in our show notes. To some extent, this accident also has the hallmarks of get-home-itis, in which pilots continue on when they shouldn't, but do so because they're strongly motivated to get back to their home airport. We talked about some of these issues in episode 114, which is titled, Get Their Itis Accidents, Red Flags, and Tips for Avoiding Them. And you can find that episode at aviationnewstalk.com slash 114. Some of the issues in this accident also speak to personal minimums. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to sit down and write out your own personal minimums. That's a list of flight conditions that you won't exceed when you fly. It can also include limitations regarding fatigue, such as perhaps not flying after 11 p.m. at night and requiring that you get some minimum number of hours of sleep before a flight. You can also write that you won't do circling approaches or perhaps that you won't do them at night. The FAA has a worksheet you can use called the PAVE Personal Minimums Checklist, and I've included a link to that in the show notes. There's also a link to the FAA's Personal and Weather Risk Assessment Guide in our show notes. And you can find those show notes at aviationnewstalk.com slash 214. Now, I hope you found the show valuable. It took two and a half days to produce, and that's time I can't be doing my regular job giving flight instruction. 
which is why I'd like to ask you to please sign up as a member to support the show as this is a listener supported show. I'm sure you already have other subscriptions, but let me ask you, are you learning anything from those that might save your life? So please go now to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, where you can become a member through our Patreon site. And by the way, people who support us at the $8 a month level already got this show a day earlier than everyone else. And people at the $20 a month level also get access to my videos. And I did post a video about this crash six days before this episode came out. You can also make a one-time donation by going to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. And thank you so much for your support of this show, however you give it, whether it's financially or through your emails and feedback and listener questions, or by telling your friends about the show. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. 